Okay, everyone, let's make a start. So good evening and assalamu alaikum. Welcome everyone, friends, colleagues, speakers, our followers, and of course, our new guests. And there are many of you for this session. Welcome especially to those of you who joined us from around the world. And at the moment, I've got two people, Adele all the way from Melbourne, Australia, and Manu from Seattle. And I know there'll be others joining us. As you can see, Macros has gone truly global. So welcome to this pre-festival event from Macfest 2021. It's on literature and racism, uh, which honors the very important international movement and Black Lives Matter. I'm personally very committed to this movement. Black Lives Matter fits beautifully with our Macfest ethos and its mission in its excellent celebration of diversity and in particular connecting communities. Today's event is one of three we are offering, celebrating Black Life Matters. The other two we hope you will join us are, this is on the 30th of January, the Black Queens of Islam with Ishmael Leah South. And the second one is challenging racism in the photography industry on Wednesday, 24th of February with Fouad Ala Barouf from Scotland and he's from Azerbaijani origin. Our program today is going, uh, is going to go live in a few days time for MacFest 2021. Please do check our website for details. And our next event after this one is a keynote address by a highly acclaimed international speaker, Professor Akbar Assam, live from Washington on Sunday, the 24th of January. I just thought I'd plug those before we go any further. All the details will be obviously in our program and website and brochure. One house rule to share with you. Jensilla is hosting, she's our marketing officer. She's hosting our session technically. And all the attendees will be muted whilst the speakers are speaking. And if you have questions to ask, please put them in the, into the chat room and they will be sent to John, who is our main host for this event. So now this evening for what you've been waiting for, we are delighted to and proud in hosting these four amazing speakers, mashallah. And you are in for a tremendous treat folks. And a lot of learning will take place, I'm sure. And I know I'll learn a lot. I'm now handing you over to John Macaulay from University of Manchester, who will chair this meeting. And let me introduce him properly by reading out his wonderful bio, mashallah. <laughs> Professor John McAuliffe works at the Center for New Writing, English, American and Creative Writing at the University of Manchester. John won the RTE Poet of the Future Award and published his first book, A Better Life, in 2002, which was shortlisted for a forward prize. His second book, Next Door, was published in 2007. His book, Of All Places, was a poetry book society recommendation for autumn 2011. And his most recent book, The Way In, received the Michael Hartnett Award in spring 2016. So many congratulations, John, for these wonderful achievements in the book world. And finally, I want to give you a warm welcome to you. And again, for hosting another MacFest event. Last year, John hosted our event at Blackwell Bookshop with, it, with his students. So thank you and over to you, John. Thanks as ever, Kazra. And welcome um, everybody to um, tonight's um, event. Um, I'm very proud to be part of MacFest for a second time. I'm only sorry that we're not all doing it in person and in the confines of a bookshop or some other um, venue like that. Although at the same time, if we were doing that, we wouldn't have visitors from um, Seattle and Australia here. And it's fantastic to see um, familiar, but also uh, many new faces and names uh, ticking across the screen um, tonight. Uh, I'm chairing tonight's event and I'm going to step in and out um, at various times to introduce our brilliant lineup of speakers. May I uh, make a comment? Has John disappeared temporarily? <laughs> he will be back in a minute. Okay. 
in the meantime, Patsy, welcome. <laughs> and other new friends, welcome that if you join us, yes. <laughs> These are the things with technical hitches. They're not in our... Oh, Zahia's here as well. Welcome, Zahia. She's going to be one of our speakers. And by the way, Zahia, Adele is up there as well. She's joined us from Australia. Oh, Kat is here as well. Kat, hi. <laughs> Marilyn, hi. Uh, Marilyn is joining us for our women's event, uh, Women of Faith event in March. <laughs> She's our comedian. Hopefully. Hopefully, yes. I'm waiting for John, so I'll keep talking while, while he joins us. <laughs> Anybody else, I can say hello to all the new wonderful friends who joined us. Hello, Margaret. Hi, Anne, again. <laughs> and, would you like me to introduce Pete? Yes, might as well introduce Pete, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so we got, we're going to... Hello, my name's Emily Zobel Marshall, and I'm a uh, lecturer in post-colonial literature. Um, I'm going to be presenting on literature and racism, but before that, let me introduce you to Pete Kalu. Pete writes across a number of genres, poetry, short stories, novels, radio and theatre plays, film scripts, TV scripts, song lyrics and flash fiction. Most of his works unsettle orthodoxies around the concept of race. His ninth novel, One Drop, will be published by Anderson Press in 2021. We have short stories coming out by People Tree Press also in 2021 and extracts from his psychedelic memoir will be published and podcast by the Royal Literary Fund in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm fascinated uh, by the idea of a psychedelic memoir by the way. Um, and his creative non-fiction is published in Manchester uh, by Manchester University Press's and uh, it's Manchester, something rich and strange, and it's out now. Um, so over to Pete. Thank you very much, Emily. And uh, thank you also to John uh, when he re-emerges for his valiant attempts. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Kisra, for inviting me. Yes, um, I do work across a number of genres. Uh, I, I, I came to art uh, trying to change the world, trying to make the case that black lives matter, if you like, uh, way back when. Uh, and I've been writing, perhaps Kister, I know I've been writing for a good 20 or 30 years in this area. And uh, perhaps in 2007, the, uh, the celebrations around the uh, parliamentary abolition of the trade in slaves. Uh, the, I worked with 10 museums on the, the commemoration of, 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 of that bicentenary. And uh, now in 2019, I think there's a project called Colonial Countryside, which looked at the National Trust uh, properties and the way in which many of those properties have a background that connects them with the slave trade. and the way in which perhaps this history had been deleted, omitted, suppressed. Uh, there, there is a, a writer, I think it's Salman Rushdie, one of his characters, uh, it said that uh, the problem for the English is that all their history happens elsewhere. <laughs> and uh, unlike, say, in America, where the slavery was visible, it was there, right there happening in the, in the, certainly in the southern states of America. Britain has always had its colonies, and what went on there didn't necessarily um, come to the knowledge of people of the time in England very quickly. And, and it's been much more easy, I feel, for England to uh, suppress that area of knowledge. So that's my work. My work has been often to bring the two elements together, the, 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 the history of the colonies with uh, the, the presence in Britain of um, things built as a result of the wealth acquired through, the, through those colonies. And uh, I'm always torn as to which uh, genre to use, which form to use, whether to use song, poetry, short story, radio play, film. I'm never quite sure what I'm going to do until I get a feel for it. And for this particular um, commission uh, from Colonial Countryside, I ended up uh, doing a, a song uh, which was uh, a departure in some senses in that I'd, I'd previously done uh, a number of reggae songs and stuff, but I wanted to do something uh, with a piano and with a young voice. So that uh, became Bluebird and uh, 
is that an adequate enough uh, introduction, uh, Kesra? Yes, good. Okay, in that case, let me uh, yield and allow you to experience the, the video. Across the sea, you can hear the oceans roar. They're searching the southwest for our With a god plan to pass if I go to Swaldo. No sugar can taste sweet. When you hear the cane from which it was beat, so listen. Where are we coming from? Where we be? The blue bit of happiness flies away from me as they sail across, across the sea. You can hear the oceans rise. Flies away from me as they sail across across the sea. You can hear the oceans roar. Thank you. <laughs> I would thank my daughter as well, who played and uh, sang the. Uh, do we have John back? I'm just checking whose mic switched on. I think it's between me and Emily at the moment, as far as I can see. Yes, um, <laughs> I, I believe I believe that John is back. Um, but uh, yeah, Hello. He, ah, John. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, 
very sorry my internet dropped there, but I got back to hear all of that marvelous song, Pete. But you, you I also heard Emily introducing you um, so well. Um, but I did want to add one thing that Pete and Kesra's contributions to something rich and strange, the nonfiction book about Manchester, are such a terrific and vital part of that book and about exactly how having so many different kinds of voices in that book from so many different communities in the city are part of what make the city strong and make that such an interesting book. Well, wonderful to hear, um, to hear that just now, Pete. Um, Emily, um, Emily Zobel Marshall, Dr. Emily Zobel Marshall is reader in post-colonial literatures at the School of Cultural Studies at Leeds Beckett University. Uh, Emily teaches courses in African-American, Caribbean, African, and Black British literature. Her research specialisms are Caribbean literature and Caribbean carnival cultures. She is an expert on the trickster figure in the folklore, oral cultures, and literature of the African diaspora, and has published widely in these fields. She has also established a Caribbean carnival cultures research platform and network that aims to bring the critical, creative, academic and artistic aspects of carnival into dialogue with one another. Emily is going to present some slides and speak to them now, which uh, reflect her current research and book on, on slavery. So you're all gonna be able to look at those images and we're really looking forward to hearing what um, Emily is going to say. I should also just follow up to say that if you do want to use the chat to tell us where you're listening from today, it would be great. I've just seen Jakarta flash across my screen. So please do let us know where it is you're based as we listen to Emily. Thank you so much, John, uh, for that introduction. And uh, what a pleasure to be here at uh, MacFest, a truly global event. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. So I'm going to be talking about uh, literature and racism, which is a vast topic. Um, I Hopefully my slides will soon appear on your screen. Um, but this is a vast topic and um, to try and do justice to you, uh, I will be focusing on some key aspects of literature and racism, past and present, to show you the role that literature has pay, played in dismantling and also perpetuating racist stereotypes. So this is going to be a presentation in three parts. So we'll have the first slide Please, uh, Ginsella, if, if that's possible. Um, is it not showing? Um, yes. Oh, is it showing? Wonderful. Okay, thank you. The next um, slide, okay. Okay, great. Um, so, I, um, so this is a presentation in, in three parts. And um, I'll be discussing, first of all, the Black Lives Matter movement of 2020 and thinking about how that movement has changed the way that we read. I'll then be moving on to looking at literature, racism and colonialism. And then finally, how books have written back to colonial and racial stereotypes. And that will also then uh, link to my own text, um, which is called American Trickster, which is about African-American folklore. So if I hopefully I'll have time to finish with a short reading um, from this book. Um, so can we ha have the uh, next slide, please? Thank you. So if we have the next slide, um, or oh, am I to do, am I to, uh, I think Ginsella, if we can have the next slide. It's not to worry. Um, there we go. There's a, uh, there's a slight delay. We're all, we're all, we're all uh, coping with these just little um, internet issues, but uh, they will certainly not um, slow us down. So this is a, an image of the Black Lives Matter movement. And what was exceptional, I'm sure you'll all agree about this summer was this wave of momentum that we saw in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement. The Black Lives Matter movement really begins in 2013 with the use of the hashtag of Black Lives Matter on social media after the acquittal of George Zimmerman in the shooting of the African-American teen Trayvon Martin. And it's the death of uh, Trayvon Martin is an innocent black uh, teenager who's at the wrong place at the wrong time 
um, that sparked these global protests. But we also, um, we know that Floyd's death, uh, George Floyd's death was not exceptional. There are only 27 days in the whole of 2019 where police did not kill someone in the US with black people making up three times as many of the 1,098 victims than white people. Now, what is uh, remarkable about the Black Lives Matter as an organization uh, is that unlike the US civil rights movement, which has focused on male leaders, um, Black Lives Matter is organized by women and it has a strong feminist agenda. Its founders, Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullors and Opal Tormenti also embrace and platform the rights of transgender and non-binary people, disabled people and other marginalized groups. Um, so it's a decentralized organization. And I think that's one of the beauties of the movement is that it also, it, it, because it's decentralized, it seeds all over the world and it takes on different forms. Um, so we saw, you know, for example, in Amsterdam during this summer, there was uh, demonstrations about a, a racist character called Black Pete. Uh, we had Edward Coulson's statue thrown into the River Avon here in the UK. So the way that the Black Lives Matter movements manifested themselves across Europe took on different forms. And I think that is also thanks to the fact that it's not a centralized organization that it can seed and kind of flower, take root in many different ways. Um, but that fact that it's also organized by women, I think is, is very important. So in the UK, we saw thousands of protesters march in solidarity with the US protesters. Um, but it wasn't just to obviously highlight what was happening in the US. This was also a fight against institutionalized racism in the UK. You know, people are starting to connect the dots with what's happening in the UK. And what was amazing about the protests over the summer is the vast number of people that took part as allies who are not of African or Asian ancestry. You know, we had this term allyship has become a kind of part of our lingua franca to be an ally and to support that anti-racist movement was suddenly high on people's agendas. Now, certainly racism um, is not a problem just over there in the US, but alive and well in the UK, and in particularly in terms of police brutality. So official figures show that police in England and Wales are three times more likely to arrest a black person than a white person, and five times more likely to use force. In the UK, we saw lots of different groups emerge as part of the Black Lives Matter movement. So there were Black Lives Matter UK, Black Voices Matter, all Black Lives UK, because there's no single, high, there's no clear hierarchy. It's not focused on a single leader. So there's these various manifestations of the movement. Um, so in the UK, um, we see what we might uh, describe, I think, um, as more of a covert than over. This is wonderfully captured, I think, in Windrush literature. Uh, for example, the writing of George Lamming um, and Sam Selvin in The Emigrants and the Lonely Londoners. I just want to share with you a little extract from Sam Selvin's Lonely Londoners. So written in the 1950s, which highlights the plight of those Caribbean migrants that were invited here to rebuild Britain after the war, but also faced terrible racism and prejudice. Um, but met often in, in more overt, um, more covert than overt forms. Now the protagonist uh, explains um, to, uh, to Galahad, who's a character who's come over to try and find work from the Caribbean. And Moses says to Galahad about the British, he says, they don't tell you outright that they don't want colored fellas. They just say, sorry, the vacancy get filled. Galahad asks if racism in the UK is worse than in America. And Moses replies, the thing is in America, they don't like you, they tell you straight so that you know where you stand. 
Over here, it's the old English diplomacy. Thank you, sir. How do you do? And that sort of thing. Now, if we come back to our present moment, we could argue that the Brexit vote has given people to voice their prejudice um, more overtly. Uh, the Grenfell tragedy, which led to the deaths of 72 people, many of them black and Asian, um, and the Windrush scandal have really highlighted the problems uh, of institutionalized racism in the UK and also given people in the UK a greater reason to protest. Coronavirus has also heightened social divides. You know, we, we, we think that in some ways, you know, the, the virus is a, is a kind of leveler because we are all vulnerable in the face of it, but it's also drawn our attention to the number of um, my, uh, uh, communities that are disproportionately affected by coronavirus and many of them um, in black and Asian communities. Now, um, one of the kind of pivotal moments of the Black Lives Matter movement was that moment where Edward Coulson, um, the slave trader, uh, the statue of Edward Coulson, the slave trader was thrown into um, the, the, the river Avon. If we could just go to the next uh, two slides, please. So there we have um, Edward Colson's statue being thrown into the River Avon. And I think that you know, this is an iconic moment and it's an, an iconic image as well of the sort of height of that moment of protest. Um, the act was condemned uh, by Priti Patel as an act of hooligan, hooliganism, which is utterly indefensible. Um, Ed, as many of us know, Edward Colson was a board member and deputy governor of the Royal African Company. And he helped see the, uh, oversee the transportation into slavery of an estimated 84,000 Africans. And it's believed that around 19,000 of those Africans died in Middle Passage um, from that, that journey from the African coast to the plantations in the so-called New World. And Edward Colson was put on a pedestal and celebrated for 125 years. Um, now, uh, perhaps there's a sense of poetic justice that he is also among the fishes, like the bodies of many of the enslaved um, that were taken from Africa to the Caribbean. Um, if we could just go on to the next slide. Thank you. Now, what has all this protest got to do with literature, you might be asking? Well, there's been a real shift, I'm sure you've noticed, in people's thinking around race and racism. And this has also been reflected in what they read and the literature that they value. For example, in June this year, Bernadine Eferisto and Rennie Edo Lodge became the first Black British women to top the UK's fiction and non-fiction paperback charts. Um, Eferisto's Girl, Women, Other won the Booker Prize in October, making her also the first Black woman to win the prize. Also in June, more than 100 writers, including Eferisto, Benjamin Zephaniah, Mallory Blackman, called on major publishing houses in the UK to introduce wide ranging reforms to make the overwhelmingly white industry more inclusive at all levels. They set up the Black Writers Guild um, and they wrote an open letter to UK publishers saying that British publishers are raising awareness of racial inequality without significantly addressing their own. So calling publishers to address their own institutionalized racism in what they publish, the advances they're given, what they also, um, for example, rec they, their, their recommendations to writers of color. So um, anecdotally, some of the authors were saying that they've been asked you know, to insert white characters into their texts to change um, the prominence of some of the black characters in their story by publishers and editors. Now we've, we've, we've moved into the present moment, but I want to take us back um, to looking at the colonial past and examining how literature has reflected um, and influenced um, the way that people see the world around them historically. 
we just go on to the next slide. Thank you. Now I tell my students that the part that literature is always political, that what you decide to read and what you decide to write is a political act. Colonial literature both supported and justified the expansion of the British Empire. In the wake of empire, post-colonial literature has challenged the representations and politics of colonial literature in an effort to fight against the legacies of colonial power and readdress the balance of representation. So colonialism works through collecting and producing and sometimes inventing knowledge about other places and representing those places at home and abroad to justify and support colonial practices. So, so this knowledge of other places and imaginative representation of other pl places has been disseminated through literature. Um, so as I said on the slide, colonialism works through imaginative and representational strategies and writing and imagining the other places and people has been central to the colonial project. It was books that helped to justify colonialism, uphold, uphold and perpetuate colonial values. And this is a map of the British Empire in 1886. And you can see, you know, how much of the, the world is pink there, part of, our, part of the British Empire at that time. Uh, next slide. So um, part of our, our, our so-called great uh, British canon of literature is made up of these particular colonial texts that justify colonialism and perpetuate colonial stereotypes. Um, for example, Heart of Darkness and um, Robinson Crusoe. Next slide. Now, uh, I want to briefly show you how um, some of these key texts have perpetuated certain stereotypes, but also how authors have um, written back and challenged them. So in Heart of Darkness, a very familiar text, we see this image of Africa as a place of darkness. Um, I'm just gonna pick up on a key passage here from this quotation, because I don't want to uh, run out of time. But um, this story tells of a steamship going up the river Congo. And the narrator looks at one of the Congolese and says, to look at him was as edifying as seeing a dog in a parody of breeches and a feather hat walking on his hind legs. So the narrator observes a Congolese who's working on the steamship and comments that to see him working so well on the steamship was as amazing as seeing an animal uh, dressed up um, in breeches and a feather hat. So it gives us an idea of the kind of status that the Congolese have in um, the eyes of uh, the narrator. The Nigerian author Chinua Achebe has called um, Joseph Conrad in a famous essay, um, a bloody racist. And uh, he said he didn't mince his words. He did actually change the article to calling him a thoroughgoing racist later on. Um, this is called, this is led, it's a huge intellectual debate that I'm, I'm only touching upon here. Uh, next slide, please. In uh, one, another famous uh, text, Robinson Crusoe, we see that moment of colonial encounter between Robinson Crusoe and Man Friday. And Robinson Crusoe describes the moment where he sees Man Friday and he says that Friday takes his foot, take, takes me by the foot, set my foot upon his head. This it seems was in token of swearing to be my slave forever. I took him up and made much of him and encouraged him all I could. So Crusoe upon seeing Friday, and he names him Friday, even though Friday might have his own name, um, has decided straight away that Friday is swearing to be his slave. That is the assumption that Crusoe has made of this so-called savage man from this colonial encounter. 
Uh, next slide, please. So I'll show you in a moment. Uh, is that a, a next slide, Ginsella, if that's all right? Thank you. Another uh, famous classic test is Jane Eyre um, by Charlotte Bronte. And in Jane Eyre, we see a portrayal of Europe and the Caribbean as very much binary oppositions. The Euro Europe is painted as sort of heavenly, pure and rational. The Caribbean as a sort of hellish place, a tainted place in a rational place. And as we know, the mad Bertha um, who's trapped in the attic by Mr. Rochester is a woman from the Caribbean. Uh, next, please. Now, I want to show you how authors have written back to some of these colonial stereotypes and writing back is a post-colonial term that specifically books which have been um, accused of, of perpetuating certain stereotypes have been readdressed and rewritten by post-colonial authors. So for example, we've got Wide Sagasso C that writes back to the portrayal of Mrs. Rochester in Jane Eyre. And then we have Faux by J.M. Coetzee, a South African author that writes back to that portrayal of Friday in Robinson Crusoe. Two fantastic books. If you haven't read them, may I urge you to read them. Uh, next slide. Um, now, Jean Rees um, has talked about why she felt she needed to readdress the balance of representation in Jane Eyre. Uh, she says, the first mad wife in Jane Eyre has always interested me. I was convinced Charlotte Bronte must have had something against the West Indies or I was, and I was angry about it. Otherwise, why did she take a West Indian for that horrible lunatic, for that really dreadful creature? Um, and then Jane Eyre, and then Jean Rees goes on to say that she wanted to create, she wanted to, I've read and reread Jane Eyre, and I am sure that the character of Antoinette must be built up. The Creole in Charlotte Bronte's novel is a lay figure, repulsive, which does not matter, and not once alive, which does. She's necessary to the plot, but always she shrieks, howls, laughs horribly, attacks all and sundry off stage. For more, for me, she must be right on stage. Uh, next, please. Um, so she creates in White Sagasa C the story of the first Mrs. Rochester. So we see the point, uh, the, 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 the life that Mrs. Rochester had before she ends up imprisoned in Mr. Rochester's attic. And it's a fabulous story. In Coetzee's Faux, which writes back to Robinson Crusoe, we have a portrayal of, uh, of Friday as a, as a complex and a character. And also the narrator, instead of being a man, a, colon a, col a colonizing man is a woman. And it's a woman who is constantly looking at Friday assessing Friday, thinking about how Friday might feel about things. The woman at the center of Faux writes, uh, sorry, narrates, Friday has no command of words and therefore no defense against being reshaped day by day with the desires of others. I say he is a cannibal and he becomes a cannibal. I say he's a laundryman and he becomes a laundryman. What he is to the world is what I make of him. So the narrator in Faux is fully conscious of the power of representation and how Friday is being represented in the text. Uh, next, please. Now, my two um, books, uh, Anansi's Journey and American Trickster, focus on the trickster figure in the literatures of the African diaspora. And, um, what I do, especially in American Trickster, is look at how American writers write back to portrayals of the trickster figure. Next slide, please. What we find in an African-American context is that folklore was used by uh, white folklore collectors to reinforce images of African-Americans as 
minstrels or childlike uh, simpletons um, and not capable of looking after themselves, in fact, in need of white benevolent masters to show them the way. You can see this in Joel Chandler Harris representation of Br'er Rabbit. Br'er Rabbit is actually an African rooted trickster figure, but in the hands of white folklorists, he becomes in many ways, a story about the nostalgia for the plantation past that was felt by whites. Um, we've got different representations of Br'er Rabbit are also found in Enid Blyton's work and Beatrix Potter, who have again, I would argue, um, misappropriated the Br'er Rabbit figure, but we don't have time to go into that right now. Um, next slide, please. In my book, American Trickster, I look at how African-American writers um, like Ralph Ellison, um, Nella Larson and Toni Morrison have taken the trickster figure, the African trickster figure, back out of the hands of those white folklorists that tried to make the trickster figure fit in with that kind of nostalgic vision of the plantation past. And they've re-built uh, um, the trickster figure in all its kind of anarchic African uh, energy and placed it center stage in their novels. So you see this in Invisible Man in passing and in Toni Morrison's work. Um, so that's what my book focuses on. Um, I will spend some time, I'll, I'll read a passage from my book in the, uh, the uh, my sort of next segment because I don't want to to take up uh, longer than uh, I've been allotted. Um, and I'll give you a little taster of, 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 my, of my work uh, in terms of writing back. But I just want to end with this quotation. Uh, next slide, please. By, uh, by the great Ben Oakry, who says, you know, if we change the stories we live by, quite possibly we change our lives. Thank you. Unmute John. John? I will introduce quickly uh, Leila as I can't hear John at the moment. So we've got, thank you so much. First of all, Emily, that was absolutely terrific, mashallah. I've learned so much and I want to hear more. And we've got somebody asking for a list as well uh, about further reading and books. So excellent, thank you so much. So we're off to Leila now. So let me introduce Leila, a dear friend and a fellow writer. Leila Abu Leila is a novelist and the first winner of the Kane Prize for African writing. Her latest books include the novel, Bird Summons and the short story collection, Elsewhere, Home, Win of the Solterre Fiction Book of the Year, mashallah. Leila's work has received critical recognition and a high profile for its distinctive exploration of migration and Islamic spirituality. Her previous novels are The Kindness of Enemies, The Translator, and New York uh, Times 100 Notable Books of the Year, The Minaret, and Lyrics Valley Alley. Fiction winner of the Scottish Book Awards, mashallah, and shortlisted for the Commonwealth Prize. Leila's work has been translated into 15 languages, and she was long listed three times for the Orange Prize. Leila was born in Cairo, grew up in Khartoum, and now lives in Aberdeen in Scotland. She's the honorary president of the SSUK, the Society for the Study of the Sudan, and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. So I'll ramble through that, but a lot of achievement there, Marshall. Leila, can over I, to you, okay? Sorry, Thank you, you very much. Before you, uh, sorry, can I just, uh, I just was unmuted uh, there, as I, I was a bit slow being unmuted, and I wanted to just add one little thing about Leila, if that's okay, Kezra. Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> um, I guess it's just one of the things that I suppose that many of us had been doing over the last year 
is trying to educate ourselves and to do more to try to understand where Black Lives Matter comes from and about historical memory um, and what, what we need to learn from what has been happening in this country and in other countries in relation to race. And one of the key books I think that I've been really enjoying over the last while is a book called African Europeans, An Untold Story by Olivet Otelli. And it's a really, really interesting book. But in that book, one of the things she talks about is how there has been a great focus on exceptional figures in restoring that sense of um, uh, what our shared history um, has been like. But she insists that we must also um, pay attention to the day-to-day -day activities um, in the different diverse communities and between those uh, communities um, over, over so many centuries. And reading um, Bird Summons reminds me of exactly how fiction, Leila's great last novel, reminds me of a connection between exceptional figures. It's a really remarkable book and it takes three women on a journey, three, mem three women who are members of, and let me get this right, Dundee's Arabic speaking Muslim women's group. And their quest um, to find um, the grave of Lady Evelyn Cobbold, the first British woman to perform the pilgrimage to Mecca. But what's really remarkable, I suppose, about the novel is not just that quest and how much we find out about these women's day-to-day -day lives, but also it's a climatization of a talking hoopoe bird to Northern Britain. And it does seem to me that it is the, one of the ways in relation to what Emily has also spoken about, about how fiction speaks back to and transforms the kinds of stereotypes and cultural norms and which could limit how we relate to one another. So I did want to add that in, in spite of all my troubles with the muting um, before uh, welcoming um, Leila, who's gonna read from her new work, I think now, yeah. Leila. Okay, thank you very much, John. And thank you, Kaisra. And thank you, Emily, for this lovely talk, very inspiring. And we're, we're all now excited to read all these books you, you recommended. <laughs> what, uh, the, you know, a white sargasso sea is, is a favorite of mine, but I haven't read Foe, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read uh, Foe. Uh, so thank you so 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 much, Emily. So um, I'm going to to read from a work in progress, and it's the current uh, novel I'm 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 working on. It's uh, set in 19th century uh, Sudan, which at that point was um, part of the Ottoman Empire, and Sudan was ruled by Egypt. However, uh, Egypt itself was, um, had been invaded by uh, Britain and the novel covers the years before the, in, the British invasion of, of Sudan itself. And one of the interesting things that I found in my research when which links to the, the topic of today is that uh, growing uh, British influence and colonial expansion in that part of, of Africa went hand in hand with the anti-slavery movement. So by that time in history, which is the end of the 19th century, uh, slavery in America and the, and the Caribbean has been abolished. And uh, the anti-slavery movement was uh, then shifted or uh, shifted its focus to, um, to ending um, uh, slavery in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire and in Africa um, uh, it, itself. Um, the East African, the story of East African slavery is not as much talked about as the West uh, Coast uh, um, uh, slavery. And this is because um, it's, it was smaller in scale and it's also different in, 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 in many ways uh, due to the influence and the rules of, uh, of Islam. And also um, the fact that, um, that it wasn't uh, part of, the, of a capitalist project. I mean, what happened is that the, the, the women and men who were enslaved and, and taken from Sudan and uh, Kenya and Ethiopia uh, to, to, to Egypt and to, to Turkey and within, this, within the countries themselves, Sudan and Egypt themselves, uh, the, the, the women were usually um, taken for domestic work and um, uh, sexual bondage and the men were recruited to be part of, of the army. So it's, it's, it's a different um, experience than, than what happened in, 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 in plantations and, 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 and so on. Um, so Sudan was a, a gateway to this trade and the raids took part in the south of the country and um, 
um, and um, anyone captured in a ra in a raid, well, well, once they got to Egypt, for example, it wasn't really to do with uh, ethnicity. It wasn't necessarily to do with them being black. So there were uh, Arabs who were sold as slaves in the markets of Egypt. There was in, in Istanbul, there would be Eastern Europeans, Albanians and so on. It, 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 it wasn't, it wasn't re re um, um, related particularly to a particular race. It was the idea of people being captured in raids and, 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 and having this status of, of, uh, of being in, enslaved. Um, so in, in my novel, I've got a young girl from the Nuba Mountains in South Sudan, and she's saved from a slave uh, raid by a Northern Arab merchant who then uh, takes her to the city of Obayid and leaves her with his uh, sister. And so she's an orphan and she's living temporarily with, uh, with the family of the man, the sister of the man who, who saved her and he go, he, he's gone away. And uh, so this is what happens to her. Uh, and there's also a mention in this piece of General Gordon and he's a British general who's working to bring an end uh, to slavery and at the same time uh, setting up the stage for uh, direct uh, British uh, rule. So Akwani was in the market when the governor's wife uh, saw her. Um, the governor in this case was uh, Turkish, not British. So uh, she was in the market when the governor's wife saw her. She was talking to the cows like she always did whenever she was sent to run an errand. The cows reminded her of home. Suddenly a woman carrying a basket of tomatoes touched her shoulder and pointed towards a carriage. The driver had just disembarked and was walking towards them. The man tending the cow said, look girl, they want you over there. The governor's wife, go, don't keep them waiting. Akwani did as she was told. She walked towards the carriage and met the driver halfway through. With him leading the way, her steps to the carriage were less tentative. The market crowd parted so that they could pass. Soon she could see a plump white arm reaching out from the carriage's window. And there was the governor's wife, Kohal rimming eyes eager, a tiny hat on her head, under which dark heavy hair and a, and a gauze white veil cascaded to her shoulder. She was saying things that Akwani couldn't understand. She was wanting something and she was used to getting what she wanted. Akwani became Nazli Hanim's girl. The governor's wife was bored and homesick. She was miserable because she had put two and two together and figured out that if her husband had truly been a great catch worthy of her, he would not have been posted to this dump. Be patient, my darling Nazli, the government said to her. We won't be here for long. It's a mistake. I'm doing everything I can to get us out of here. He would do anything to pacify her, to keep her occupied and happy anything to stop the sulks and the tantrums. A little black girl, why not? He tracked down the family and tossed them the money, wrote out a bill of sale and had it witnessed. This was how Akwani started her new life, officially enslaved. She was given a new name because her old one was deemed foreign and unsuitable. Akwani became Zamzam. Compared to the others enslaved in the governor's household, Zamzam had an easy life, at least at first, before the novelty wore off and Nazli got bored of her. In those early days, she could not have enough of her. She bathed and fed her. She dressed her in outrageous costumes, which she took great pleasure in designing and ordering from the tailor. At times, she even dressed her up as a boy. She taught her how to sing, insisted that she perform all sorts of acro acrobatics. Once she commanded her to climb up a tall cupboard and dance on top of it, Zamzam lost her balance, fell and broke her arm. This was the first time Nazli hit her. How dare you fall off, what a nuisance you are. With a broken arm, Zamzam was not much fun to play with. She was tossed aside and so ended up with the others who had their quarters outside across from the kitchen. Khadija, the older cook, took care of her. She set her arm and made sure that Zamzam had plenty of rest. Khadija could speak Shuluk and it was such a relief to talk, to listen and to understand. Khadija explained things to Zamzam, explained how the governors came and went. Some were Albanians, some were Egyptians, some had been stationed elsewhere in Sudan, some in other parts of the Ottoman Empire. They all served the big Sultan in Constantinople. Everyone, everyone in the world 
had someone higher than him. Khadija herself was special, she explained, because she had been freed long ago. She was now earning her living at $3 a month, which Zamzam guessed must be a huge amount because of the way Khadija dropped her voice when she said it. She was a Muslim and had gone at her own expense to the Hajj, further enhancing her superiority. The others in the kitchen belonged to the, kitchen, to the government and to this specific compound in Ubayyid. Zamzam's position was different, Hadija explained. She belonged specifically to the government and his Nazli Hanim. There was a difference. Zamzam was treated better, but to some extent, the others could go, come and go as they pleased. There was something impersonal and collective about their predicament. One day they might all be freed en masse, though it had happened before, when General Gordon went to El Fasher, it could happen here. Khadija was bald and she had a yellow string of beads around her head. She took them off when she made her ablutions, ablutions and hitched up her dress over her head when she prayed, standing straight in her pantaloons. In the late afternoon, she would sit in the shade of the guava tree, which grew in the backyard and smoke a red clay pipe. Zamzam liked to sit near her, spelling the pipe and eating unripe goafa. Khadija took an interest in her story. When your merchant comes back, she said, he will ask about you for sure. But would he be able to get you back? Maybe, I've seen it happen. But then the governor is the governor and Nazli Hanim has her whims. This nevertheless comforted Zamzam, seductive hope lightening up the dreary outdoor kitchen where they worked. From dawn to sunset, they cleaned, cooked, washed, ironed, and fed the considerable number of Baltagia bodyguards and staff living in the government's, governor's compound. One of the young women, Hebra, tall and beautiful, with hair extensions made of goat's fur and secured with gum, was in charge of the guest quarters. Whenever a guest arrived, all military men, and there was a continuous flow of them, she would make sure that his room was ready. She would serve his meals and take charge of his laundry and mending. She would polish his boots. She would massage his back and press his feet. She would also make him feel truly welcome. And to achieve that, she must be available and accessible. Expectations differed between one man to the next and she could not always be, and could not always be predicted. Some men ignored her, some pinched and flirted. Some pulled her to bed, a few, were brutal, a few would remember afterwards to toss her a coin or two. Hebra must continue to smile, to lower her head, though not all men wanted sub subverse subservience, she explained to Zamzam. Some liked her sassy and uncouth. Some mm. preferred the thrust of vulgarity, the thrill of coarseness. Some needed a bit of help. She must tell these men apart, use her wits, find out what they wanted before they knew they wanted it intuition, sharpness, flexibility, these were the skills she honed. The others, and even kindly Khadija, admired Hebra and held her in esteem. While Khadija mothered Samzam, Hebra took on the role of the young auntie. I will teach you all I know, she would say. Don't corrupt the child, Hebra. I'm telling you, Khadija, she, had put, she has potential. She turned and winked at Zamzam. Go on, tell them what the major gave you this morning. Zamzam had gone with her to the guest quarters to help serve the early morning tea. The major was a large genial man, thinning hair offset by a large mustache and thick sideburns. Still in his underwear, he had fondled Zamzam's cheeks and squeezed her backside. What a sweetie you are, he said. Why do they hide all the treats from me and fob me off with the same thing every visit? He laughed at his own jokes while Hebra tutted and fussed over him. He gave Zamzam a coin, which afterwards she handed over to Hebra because it seemed the right thing to do. The anecdote was met with smiles among the kitchen staff and Zamzam was pleased to be in their company, their toughness and warm sadness inside, their sorrow that seeped out in sunsets and in songs that burst out in nightmares. Many of them shouted in their sleep, thrashed out at their enemies. The pain in them was so deep it was almost forgotten distant memories of loved ones and homes, those who died on the way, those who were God knows where. They only spoke about the here and now, the silly mistress, the governor who would rather be elsewhere, his baltagia with their whips, which they could aim at the household staff if they were ordered to do so. Work and more work, dragging themselves at the crack of dawn to sweep the dust off the veranda, to polish the floor as the young mistress instructed them to do, 
to wash the curtains again, to chop, boil, fry, and break their backs over the fire. Zamzam went with Hadija and Hebra to a wedding and danced for the first time as a young adult. She did not need to learn how to dance because the rhythm was in her and the movements felt so natural that it was as if all she needed was the drum. How well Hadija danced, even though she said she was 65. How beautiful, how supple was Hebra's body, as if it were pure muscle and flesh without a single bone. The beat of the drum went inside Zamzam, thrilled her with feelings she did not understand, raked memories of her mother, mother's body and her mother's mother and her mother's mother's mother. All of them had known these breasts jiggling, their knees bouncing, sisters on either side. It was the Zagruta though, which Zamzam could not master, no matter how hard she tried, twisting her tongue, holding up her hand to cup over her mouth, but the joy cry would not come out. Hebra and Khadija laughed at her. It can't be taught, Hebra said. It just happens. You have a feeling, an excited feeling. Something good is happening. Everyone is around you all together. And, in it, and then it just bursts out of you. Khadija spoke of the enslaved women when they were freed and masked by General Gordon at El Fasher, heading out with their bundles balanced on their heads and babies slung on their back. On that day, you could hear the women's ululations from far, far away. So, um, so as this uh, extract shows, with regard to to women, the 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 life, the their life was very much about domestic work and uh, sexual bond bondage, and this was the kind of slavery that was practiced in in Sudan. And the circumstances of the three women in this extract are, are different. There is the oldest woman who is, she's, the, she's free, she's, a, uh, she's free, and she uh, converted to Islam and she's uh, loyal to her, to the empo, uh, em, uh, employers. And then there is uh, the young uh, lady, Hebra, who is, um, who is basically owned by, 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 by the government. And then there is Zamzam, who is the, the, the little girl who is, um, uh, belongs to the to the to the government governor and his and his wife as a specific person. Um, um, the um, so in this case in this um, in this story Zamzam is a child and the governor is is happy with his his wife, but in another scenario the governor could have relations with 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 the with the with the enslaved woman of the household. And this was allowed within uh, Muslim uh, culture. And the interesting thing which made uh, slavery within Muslim societies different than with Western societies was that the children born from this union between uh, the, the, the master and the enslaved woman were acknowledged by society and by the father. They were legitimate, they were free. And, and the mother became free after giving birth and the children were given the same rights, inheritance, et cetera, as their siblings, whose, uh, whose mother would, was the official uh, wife. So this is of course a, a big, big uh, uh, difference. And, um, and so now we have a situation in Sudan, for example, where in every, almost every family, there would be a branch which is descended from a, an enslaved woman but we can't, we can't tell each other apart. We're all, uh, you know, the, 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 the same. Um, uh, the, the extract also points to changing of the name. And I think that also happens. Uh, Emily mentioned that about the, ch the, the, the changing of, of, of the name. So Khadija has an, has a, this is a proper Muslim name. And this, uh, you know, shows that she's, uh, you know, she's free and that she's a, a, a Muslim. Uh, Zamzam is also um, a, a Muslim name, but Hebra actually is a specific uh, a, a slave name. It, it, the word Hebra is uh, ink, and so she's named Inky. So this is very much uh, a kind of a reference to her skin uh, color and a deliberate attempt to, mar to mark her out as someone who is enslaved. This is not a name that, that the, uh, you know, a free person would, uh, would have. Um, so with, with having a situation where the Northern uh, Sudanese were enslaving the Southern Sudanese or facilitating their, uh, you know, their transport in, 
further on to Egypt and to, to, uh, to, to Turkey, there was of course racism and there was of course colorism. Um, and then again, it, there is of course differences from the Western e experience because even though the Northern S S Sudanese consider themselves to be Arab, they are still Africans. And uh, in a Western environment, we would consider them uh, black and they consider themselves, I mean, Sudanese identify as, as, as black. So it's, it's, it's not really this, uh, the same. One of the interesting uh, anecdotes I uh, came across in my, in my research, which uh, is actually uh, uh, a Northern uh, Sudanese man in the 19th century. And this is a time of war and a time of displacement. So he's telling that he's saying that he uh, found out that his niece, uh, he found out that his niece in another part of the country had married a black freed slave. And so he's furious, you know, he's, he considers himself an Arab and he, he thinks that this is uh, offensive. And so he travels to save the, uh, the woman from, from the marriage. He, he travels to save his niece from the marriage. When he arrives and he goes to the house of, of his niece and her husband, uh, she refuses to leave with him. She says to him, I'm happily married and I'm not gonna leave my, my husband and, and, go, and go with you. And what is interesting in the story is that the imam of, of, of the village who has uh, may facilitate the, the marriage, he comes out in support of the, of, of, of the, of the woman, of the niece, and says that, uh, you know, you're not allowed to take this woman against her will away um, from, from her husband. And the, and the whole village comes out in support of, of the married couple. And so the uncle then uh, go, goes away. So um, this this was one of the, the kind of the stories that I that I, I found, and uh, that's it. I wanted to kind of like share with you some of the um, you know the the different um, aspects of the, the the kind of the East African uh, uh, coast uh, story. Thank you. Really fascinating, Leila, and thank you very much. Leila, what's the new novel going to be called? Well, <laughs> I have a working title, um, Scorched uh, River, but uh, I don't know. Sometimes my titles get, um, you know, changed by the time they go through the publication uh, uh, processes. You, you talked about uh, uh, bird summons and that, that had the, um, the working title of the hoopoo while I was writing it, <laughs> but it, it got changed at the end. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. And a real pleasure to hear um, the new work, Leila, and a privilege for all of us um, to get an insight into what you'll be doing and hopefully to seeing it in a year or two time at Scorched River or as, as whatever it will um, uh, come to us as in book form. Thanks. We're going to, um, we've already had a couple of questions on the back of what you've just read and uh, of what Emily presented, um, but please do add any further questions um, that you might have for any of our writers. I, I have asked um, Pete, um, and Emily, um, but also Kezra, if they wouldn't mind um, offering us short readings from their work um, now as well. So I wonder, Pete, if you would uh, mind uh, coming back on as your other guys, and uh, not so much as a as a songwriter, um, but but reading from from your written work now. Hello, am I back on? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> so, well, um, you, oh, are we going to the section where we're we're reading a short extract or? Yes, yeah, uh, short extract. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm uh, aware of the time, so I will try to keep it brief. Um, but the extract is uh, something that it's called incantation. It crosses a little bit with Emily's work because it uh, features two characters: one Moko Jumbi. Uh, if people know Moko Jumbi, they're the, the, the carnival uh, trickster characters who dance on stilts. And there was a time when I had a whole band troupe that I uh, taught to dance on stilts and I was up there on the six foot high stilts myself. So um, <laughs> I had to leave that as I got older and older, my hips couldn't quite <laughs> make it. <laughs> but uh, the, what the characters represent interests me. And the... Um, that was Moko Jumbi, and then Eshu, Eshu Elegba, uh, again, I'm sure uh, Emily for sure will know 
that is a West African trickster character. And um, I, I, I was in Trinidad. I was a writer in residence at the University of West Indies, Trinidad, and I was working with them on writing, etc. And uh, for once, uh, uh, I was able also to draw upon a couple of languages, French and Spanish, because the colonial um, uh, patina of, of Trinidad it, it involves the uh, successive invasions, if you like, from the French, from the Spanish, from the Portuguese, etc, etc. And it was the first place where I thought, you know what, I can use all the languages I've got in one kind of piece. And it, it's a performance, really. It's an incantation. And they're, they're recording it right now in, in, in Trinidad. I'm going to try and do it sitting down because my camera doesn't like it when I stand up. Uh, they, it cuts out. Um, and I'm not going to sing. <laughs> it's got a song in it, but I'm not going to sing the song. I, I, uh, I, I prefer to leave my daughter to do that. <laughs> that element. I'm not as talented. There we go. It's a bit of a, a dirge. It's called Moko Jumbi Incantation. Things scribbled in margins, the spilled fruit seed of gardeners, linguists, carvers in their crossings, hauntings, meridian measurings, a constant shifting of the phantom cargo of memory into weavings, trailings, pathways. I pause at the crossroads as Eshu arrives. Hear me now, écoutez bon, digame lo que pasaba. Stories from the perfumeries of Sevilla of los Nagreros del Rio Guadalquivir, los conquistadores buscando el oro, las barcas dolorosas, the stenching folly of the Oyibo. Tell me everything. From under this hash and hex, by the throwing off of murk, mud, pushing through jet sam, in this way, newness shakes its holy dusted head and leaps into the world, hybridizing, creolizing, conjuring from the sprawl and depth of the Carib, from African hinterlands, from the debt bond courts of India. Yes, newness comes swirling into the sweep of archipelago, sliding across the chopping stilts of Mokojumbi. Eshu is alive. Écoutez bon. The modulations, mutations, hallucinogens. Watch the stilt dancers measuring the movements from the overwhelm with the arc of their stilts the swivel, swivel of their leggy compasses, destiny made manifest. Nemesis, nemesis, nemesis. An unraveling, a double display of fear, consciousness tripled, flung into a trillion synapses, carrying the old voltages, channeling heat to light new fires. Horned, gored, grooved, the mutating voices disappearing into valleys to be transmogrified, becoming tin, Pan, the quake rattle, kish boom that leaps from island to island, hopping from continent to continent, declaring renewal, newness in a syncopated, shimmering burst of brilliance. Don't ask me, qu'est-ce qu'il dit, lo que creen, lo que piensan, pues hay cosas que no podemos entender, no podemos sobrevivir. Never still, the mockles rock constantly. They leap back in time, shaken by the tunneling, the pathways, conduits, viaducts, the signaling of the Orishas. High and far seeing, dancing futures, stomping the dust beat of future trials, future visions, hailing the rendezvous of future victories. They tower above us. We can only crane our necks, behold them, read the scattered bones of their divinations. Fantastic. Okay, thank you. Uh, the part the, uh, where I ended, that's when the song kicks in. <laughs> you have to wait for the song. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful to hear that um, piece. And I think we might ask Emily now to, which is, it's hard, it's a hard act to follow, Emily. But if you're able to talk about your own writing back along the lines of what you were um, discussing earlier. Yes, well, um, that was wonderful, Peter. I, I, I loved it. And um, we must talk carnival because we're both in carnival troops and we're both obviously obsessed with carnival. So we need to talk more about carnival. And actually, um, Pete's poem has inspired me to write, uh, read a poem that I've written recently. Um, and it's, uh, be, it's to be read in the style of the Midnight Robber. Um, Pete will know the Midnight Robber is a traditional masquerade character found on the streets um, in Carnival. And the Midnight Robber is a kind of truth teller. Midnight Robber wears a big sombrero and um, 
and is a kind of agent of death and destruction. And traditionally in carnival in the Caribbean, the midnight robber will stop you in the street and will do a kind of big bombastic speech and you have to pay the midnight robber for his speech. So it's a traditional character. There's elements of African masquerade in, 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 in it, but it's also, he's, a, he's also influenced by the cowboy uh, films and the uh, obsession with Westerns that you find in the Caribbean. Now, my, my Midnight Robber character is a Nancy Midnight Robber because I've introduced you to my books and my, my two books have been about trickster figures. So you know, my latest book is called um, American Trickster. It focuses on uh, the Br'er Rabbit trickster in African-American culture, but I also have uh, my book on Anansi, the trickster in Caribbean culture. So, um, so this, this poem, so I'm gonna read one poem called Carnival Nadan. Um, I haven't got, got, as you've all um, probably realized, quite got the, the Caribbean accent for it, but you'll just have to overlook that. And, uh, and the second uh, poem I'm gonna read is about the Black Lives Matter movement and it's called uh, Time for Breath. And this is inspired by Pete's poem. Um, if I've been, been inspired to, to read it and share it with you now. So it's Carnival Nadun, it's a midnight robber speech. Hear me now, this is the midnight robber. Beside me, Anansi, my Ginal trickster brother. Here to truthify like no other. Here to tell you, carnival, not done. As brother COVID will soon be dead and gone. Mm -hmm. For one year, the music, it was quiet. But we is getting ready for a total riot. Carnival at home is what we did one time. See my brethren on the screen, had a little wine but a volcano of passion is building in we heart. All are we are scared it could tear our hearts apart. Tis carnival spirit waiting for release, ready to fix us on our dancing feet. Feel the badness base and the sweat and the heat bringing Bacchanal back into the streets. She will not let go until our body beat. So hear me prophecy and hear it good. Hear each little word, make sure you've understood. This summer carnival, she back and she gone stay. Make we dance and fight until the break of day. Emancipate from history and the troubles of our time. On our juve morning, our sun is going to shine. Carnival was resting. She waking up full power. This year, she's gonna rip it up and watch the watchman cower. So join me and Nancy upon the streets in August 21, shouting at the mockmen, carnival, not done. So that, <laughs> that was a poem for everybody who's missing carnival. And we all had to deal with the Zoom carnivals, online carnivals, which you know were wonderful in their own way this year. But obviously, you know, we just, we so miss miss that that time on the street to celebrate um caribbean culture so um that was from the anansi midnight robber this one is a poem that i've written in response to the black lives matter movement and it's called time for breath time for breath and so the summer heaved and swelled with protest Although nothing new and the old violence lived on, this time the world was watching, captured, contained, sheltering in place. The people had nowhere else to look but at the knee on his neck, using his last breath to holler for mama with the knee on his neck. And so they rose up left their shelters, filled squares and parks with bold bodies, filled signs with stop killing us, say their names, rise up and resist. They fought Black Pete in Amsterdam, King Leopold in Brussels, while Colston in Bristol, they cast into the Avon, joining the bodies he had littered across the seabed, and the people screamed enough of this same 
old pain. Enough corpses, enough crushing black bodies, time for a new story to hit our lungs, let fresh air beat back bad blood, for now is time for breath. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. That was great to hear. Two wonderful poems. Um, I don't know if you can see on the screen, everybody is applauding you. Muted applause, <laughs> but full applause. Um, <laughs> Thank you, John. We're just going to hear um, one last speaker before we open up to questions. So we may run a little over time, as you may have predicted when you saw an event that was going to have um, four speakers. And we're going to finish. Um, I've asked Kendra, um, the uh, founder of this fantastic festival, um, and such a great figure whose energy has powered these events over the last couple of years um, to read some new work. As many of you will know, Kezra Shiraz is a screenwriter as well as a fiction writer um, and was appointed MBE earlier this year for her services to gender equality and cultural learning. So Kezra, can I ask you to, uh, to unmute yourself and, uh, and to read to us uh, now as well? Thank you so much, John. How can I compete with the other three, Marcella? Absolutely amazing. I'm so proud of you guys. You've done a wonderful job today. I really, really loved it. I'm going to keep it short. I'm going to read from this book. It's uh, The Concubine and the Slave Catcher. I wrote it in 2016 from a short story I wrote uh, quite a few years ago, set in Boston, and it's about slavery. I was visiting, uh, I was appearing at Arkansas Literature Festival on the way back to England, stayed for a couple of nights in Boston, and I ended up visiting this museum devoted to slavery. And I watched this video about slaves being caught by their slave owners, even after 50 years when they had run away. And I was horrified by the whole idea. And it was totally new for me. And you know what? As a writer, it's one of those amazing moments you have when suddenly I had a full story in my head within 10 minutes. And of course, I had to do all that research. I knew nothing about 18th century Boston, etc. So the story is called mm -hmm. Slave Catcher. It's set in a home of a woman called Lucinda. She is a woman passionate about freeing the slaves. And in her household, you have Gwen, the housekeeper, and you have a black maid called Ayana. Now, something happens in the story, and I'm not gonna tell you what, because you have to read the story to find out. But what happens is something happens and Gwen loads Ayana and she decides to sell her to the slave catchers. So the scene I'm gonna to read to you is that moment in time. In her bed that night, Gwen relived the scene that afternoon when Mistress Lucinda and Master Cape were out of the house. And only she, Ayana, and the young errand boy were at home. No, Gwen, please save me, Ayana had screamed as the field marshal, one of the officers, dragged her out of the house. He manhandled Ayana as she slipped on the slush made by the carriage wheels, badly grazing her hand and squealing in pain, her clothes dripping with icy muddy water. Holding onto his tall hat, the man pushed her roughly from behind, keeping a vice-like grip on her wrist. Two of the tall and formally dressed officers with rifles in their hands stood waiting beside the carriage, ready for action if, if required. Ayana had thrown another desperate look over her shoulder at the closed door of her employer's house, unable to believe what was happening to her, that Gwen, the housekeeper, had let the men into the house to drag her away when the kind Mistress Lucinda, who fought so hard for the black folks, was absent from home. Benjamin, the 12-year-old errand boy from the house, who had been sent by Gwen deliberately to collect a parcel of tablecloths from Molly's drapery shop, ran up to the man. Hey, where are you taking her, Ayana? Leave her alone, you dogs. Mind your own business, you little brat. We are following the law. Need to return these colored people back to their rightful owners. Anyway, we were invited into your home. What? Benjamin looked aghast unable to believe his ears. This was the home of Mistress Lucinda, who was fighting to protect black people. Benjamin, run, please go and find Master Cape. Ayana told him, hope gathering in her face. The young boy nodded and sped off. Ayana looked imploringly at the door of Mistress Lucinda's home again, 
before being pushed into the carriage. I'll leave it there, John. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and wonderful to hear that, um, Kezra. And so brilliant at the end. With everything else that you're doing, that you're still in touch with the fiction writing also. Um, and able to not a lot at the moment, but yes. <laughs> OK, <laughs> over to you and the questions. <laughs> um, so uh, we, have, we have some really interesting questions questions have come in, which I think Ginsella has popped into the chat, but one of the questions that came um, from Kat uh, Lum, um, and Kat asks a little bit about how, um, how research uh, works, and I guess this question goes to all the different kinds of research, and it's something that Kezra has just um, touched on, um, about how, how do you trust, I suppose, sources that come from colonial contexts and how do you find um, the material to give the other side of the stories when so much of those archives are um, unavailable or destroyed about the everyday invisible life of race and slavery and Leila I might come to you first on that one if that's okay because your your novel speaks so interestingly um, to that and then maybe to Emily um, and, and then Pete and finally Kezra. Um, I think you have to kind of like dig for, dig for it in places where you might not find it and uh, where the writer themselves, like this, the story I mentioned about the man who went to kind of to save his, his niece, he wasn't, he was writing his autobiography and he's proud of this story to show that he's the man of the family and that he's, you know, he cares about all this and he's narrating all these things that happened when he was actually a young, quite young in his 20s at the time. Uh, so uh, then you find something that, that, that he didn't really um, intend it to be there. So I think it's just, in, in, in my case, I've just found that you have to kind of like, kind of like uh, really look, dig deep and kind of do, a, do detective work uh, because they're not, the, the people who are writing are not really interested maybe, or if their intention wasn't to give this particular Piece of information, but I'm having like to take it out. I suppose that's sort of a great creative impetus as well. Leah. Yes, yes, it is. It is. It is very, um, uh, you know, very in, in inspiring. But of course, and and we have to admit that every, like maybe maybe if I wasn't uh, maybe 20 years ago, I might have not had the same interest. I might not have had the same understanding that I that I do now. So. So we, we ourselves as researchers, we're influenced by Black Lives Matters. We're influenced by what we are learning about at, at the time. And this kind of uh, pushes us in, in, in different uh, di directions, yeah. Great, thank you, Leila. Emily, um, in terms of how, how you're researching um, folk tales as much as the novels themselves, how, how do you find where your research sources come from outside, I suppose, the colonially established libraries and, and, and research centers? Yes, it's a, it's a really interesting question. It's a great question. Um, thank you, Kat. So for my, uh, I'll give you an example from the, my two books. So from, for my first book, uh, which looked at the Anansi stories, the Anansi trickster folk tales that were brought from West Africa to the Caribbean with the enslaved. Um, I was very aware that the earliest written recordings of the stories were actually by colonial uh, um, writers. So you have, uh, for example, a, um, a collection which is written actually in, in Ghanaian tree. So it's, it's, it's actually written in the Ghanaian language and they're collected from Ghanaian people um, in the 1900s by, um, by a colonial, a white colonial author. So they are, these stories are quite, um, I guess, you know, authentic in some ways, but obviously they're not from the mouths of the people themselves. They're still represented, it's still the channel through, through the white uh, colonial eth ethnographer. So what I did for that, for that particular piece of research, because it's about oral folk tales, I spent three months in Jamaica um, collecting oral folk tales from people. And they ranged from taxi drivers to the Maroons, the descendants of escaped slaves, academics, um, storytellers. So I, I kind of immersed myself in the oral history of the stories to try, try and navigate in that problem of 
you know, the scribal culture being mainly recorded by the colonial um, uh, uh, regime, if you like. For the Br'er Rabbit stories, which are African-American trickster stories, I, um, I didn't go over to the US to collect uh, the oral narratives, but what I was able to find were collections of folk tales by African-American um, uh, uh, collectors. So they were very, they're, they're not, they weren't kind of uh, easy to access or easy to find, but while there were a lot, there was a lot of interest in black folklore by white collectors um, in the late 19th century in, 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 um, in the US, you also had these pockets of, of black collectors as well that collected stories. And obviously the stories that they were getting um, from African-American community were really different to the ones that the community told to the white collectors. Mm -hmm. So you find the ones from, uh, told to the white collectors are often quite watered down. They're not as sexually explicit. They don't have a, a, as much of that kind of anarchic energy and they, and they don't critique the plantation regime um, in the same way as the ones uh, collected by, by black collectors. It's, it's really interesting, Emily, and even when you were describing, you know, your biography about your work with the establishing platforms and networks as well, and this sense that, you know, the research happens in collaboration with other workers. Uh, it's so interesting to hear your description of working differently with different kinds of groups and different kinds of um, folk collectors um, for, for your work. Pete, I, I was wondering if you could say something, Peter Kalu, about the languages of Trinidad, which is sort of this amazing to hear these voices being carried into your into the kind of the, the big melting pot of, of of that dirge as you called it. Yeah, um, it, it, I I would say that yeah the, the melting pot in Trinidad and and the the different in fact uh, you have to rewind a little bit because I was in Seville uh, I was in Sevilla uh, in Spain. Uh, at, a, at, a, at a gathering, and I met some uh, as a Spanish historian of the slave trade in Seville, uh, and uh, he he produced this excellent book looking at uh, the, the the history of, of of that area. And um, I think what happens in terms of that research question is you you just accumulate information over time, over time. But there are also psychological difficulties. There are there are there are there are. Um, uh, reticences or, or um, reluctances to to go where sometimes we need to go. And um, just to give you one example, when I was working on um, a story around Speak Hall in Liverpool, which was uh, owned uh, the National Trust property owned by Richard Watt the uh, first, who'd made a lot of his money in Jamaica in plantations, and I proposed by one of my sh short stories that. Um, he raped African women, enslaved African women on the plantations. You know? Now, there is a way of describing that in a, that doesn't use the term rape. You could say, you know, uh, uh, there were offspring produced as a result of a union, you know? And, and so this, this, this question of how do we frame these things, you know? I, I rarely use the word slave. I will say an enslaved African. I won't use the word slave because that's a so these psychological battles with language uh, inform how we write. But give, so with the um, the um, the speak hall story, um, the research I, I, I was uh, opposed by my minders at the National Trust uh, who said, you know, you cannot say this. You know, you don't have the evidence for it. And I said, well, look, look at the circumstances in which. Uh, Richard Watt I uh, w was present in Jamaica. Go, go look at um, Wedderburn, who had the estate directly next to him. And, and we've got Wedderburn, Wedderburn's son saying, my father was a rapist. I am, I live because he raped an enslaved African woman, you know? Um, still, it was a, a battle. And then uh, I got hold of probably the most horrific diary in British history. It's a huge thing. And it's the diary of a, a man called Thomas Thistlewood. Mm. I've got the name right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. If you go through that diary and find out what was going on through Thistlewood, who, who just documented everything, you, you, you find evidence that is, that, 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 that is 
incontrovertible about the horrors that went on. So then you've got another problem, or perhaps it's the same problem return to, which is you have to deal with it with your heart. It, 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 it tears you. It, it, it's an emotional stress to revisit this trauma from many hundreds of years ago. But as writers, as artists, we've got to reimagine this stuff. You know, and so the trickster characters and the folklore, etc. You know, sometimes they have ways of looking at, ways of dealing with what is actually a very deep, harrowing trauma. And so, coming back to Trinidad, and briefly, I know I've overrun John. Um, the, the 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 incantation is is is, a, is an attempt to cross histories, cross oceans, cross populations, and cross languages and pull it all together. But I never know enough, you know, I, know, I don't know about the, 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 the Sudanese uh, uh, participation in slavery and, and how it differs. I know a little bit about it, but I'll learn from Layla. I'll go, I'll go back to reading more books and, and meditate on it. And I think it's a lifelong journey. And I guess as an artist, I try to say to myself, um, what, what, what can we say with some confidence and, and, and and I was placed with a number of professors of history. <laughs> I'm constantly working, actually. I'm working right now with a professor of history, uh, a, 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 an expert in the Atlantic Ocean of the 18th century. You know, I was saying, okay, if these slave ships sail across this ocean, who was on them? You know, and, and we would argue about it. And we'd, we'd get, they're very, very, very diverse uh, crew, actually, uh, that were on these. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's connecting the historians, connecting the evidence, and having a kind of courage to to see the evidence to its end not not to not to 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 balk at oh this is so horrific let us run away from it this is difficult john i hope I've, I've meandered around your question <laughs> i think that's the best i can do thank yeah, that's, you <laughs> it's interesting answer but also i think I, like i do think your poem answers that question just as well as what you're saying now because of the way those different voices sort of uh compete with one another and and, and can coexist with one another as well. So re um, really, really interesting could I, um, answers. And could I just add, John, I just wanted to add that, you know, I think that it, it is that, just moving on from what Pete has said, you know, it is, it's the, 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 the job of poets and writers to build those voices back up because those are the voices that are missing from the authoritative historical narrative. You know, so when Pete says that his mind as the National Trust stopped him, you know, from, from fictionalizing that particular element of the story, that's, you know, that, that is, that they, in a way, that's trying to stop, you know, the, what the writer does, which is to, to, to put the voices back in, uh, yeah. that are missing, you know, the gaps, to fill the gaps with the voices of those that have been, have not been heard in history. I think that's absolutely right, Emily. And I, I do think that this is, I suppose one of the questions that as a writer you often get challenged about, isn't it, is about what it exactly, what does, what can writing do? But it, but it, it provides ideas and it regenerates debates and it creates new points of contact for readers to think differently. Um, Kezra, I know you spoke a little bit about starting with an idea and having to discover through research where your story in Boston was going. But I wondered if you wanted to say anything about the difficulties of working with different kinds of archives. Um, in your work and even, I suppose, in terms of the festival as well and, and, and in education. Okay, uh, I found for this new collection, this book I've written in 2017, most of the stories were set in different uh, countries, new environment, new places, new ideas. I ended up doing a lot of research. For example, the Holocaust story, Train to Krakow, I suddenly had to talk to my Jewish friend, go pouring over the internet, Black slave was totally new to me. I had to find out what clothes they wore in 18th century Boston, what food they were eating, what the kitchen uh, fire looked like, you name it, all of that had to be done. But what I really want to mention now is I've been researching for a novel set in Morocco and I've actually lived with two families, stayed, entered their lives, been everywhere, done everything, spoken, sampled. And you know what? I still don't feel confident. I feel it still won't be right, that I'll make a mistake somewhere else. My other novels are set in Pakistan, which is like a second country. I feel comfortable with whatever I've written. With this one, I've done awful lot of research, but I still feel I'm gonna make a mistake somewhere else. So there's always this issue of having to check with people. I wrote a story called The Concubine in this book, set in Peru, 
And this was idea when I went on a writer's retreat. I came away and I thought, who do I go back to check about the name, the detail? And I find it's an extra challenge as a writer to make sure that what you write is accurate. It's, it's, it, it gives the ambience of the place without making a mistake. And it takes an awful lot of time as well. But very interesting as well. It, it sort of enriches your world. So I'll keep it to that for the moment. So I don't know what we want to do, John. Do we go for another question or shall we leave it at that? It's uh, 22 7. And so what do you people think? Uh, I'll leave it to you, John, your chair, you decide. <laughs> well, I've just had a note from Ginsella saying that we have um, uh, over a hundred comments and statements and about how much people have enjoyed hearing each of our speakers tonight. Um, mm -hmm. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and it's been great to hear you talking differently about how your writing engages with history um, in a creative way and remakes our history for us. And, gives us that sense of historical memory, which is so important. And it's the kind of thing I'm thinking about all this week as the Brexit negotiations here in the UK wind their bloody way to an end and about the different kinds of histories that we need to keep on reminding ourselves um, about as that happens. So I, I think we might, um, we might finish there tonight. Um, Kezra has given you, I think, a really great lineup of what else is going on um, with MacFest over the coming weeks and weeks. Um, so please do look out for further events. But I wonder if Ginsella would be in a position to unmute everybody um, so that we can all actually noisily um, thank Emily Zobel Marshall, um, Peter um, Kalu, and Leila uh, Abulela for um, their wonderful readings um, and conversations tonight. <laughs> John, I have to thank you. You have been yeah. a true host, Marcella. You kept it flowing. You added your own bits and you got your academic background, your literary background. Absolutely a terrific host. So a round of applause from wonderful John. <laughs> thank you so much for hosting. And thank well, you to pleasure. everyone who have joined us from around the world. And Thank you to our speakers again, as John has said. Thank you to Ginsilla for hosting it. And thank you to all of those people who've actually added their chat, their question. We will be back and you know our email if you want to get in touch. And please do join us for our next two events. Again, on the matter of Black Lives Matter. So goodbye for the moment. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kestra. Great Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye Marilyn. Bye, Bye Kesra. Bye. 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 Bye, all. Bye, Bye, Jackie. Bye, Bye Jackie. Bye, Barbara. Bye, Bye Marilyn. Jackie. Happy Hanukkah to 